Well, hello, boys and girls, and welcome back to Library Class at Home with Mr. S. We have been reading Stuart Little by E.B. White, and we've read chapters 1, 2, and 3 so far. In chapter 3, we learned about his morning routine and how much work it takes for him to brush his teeth and for him to wash his face. We're going to read chapter 4 today. Chapter 4 is called Exercise. Exercise... Huh, I bet Mr. Karsko would like this chapter. All right, if you see him, tell him about it. Okay, chapter four. One fine morning in the month of May, when Stuart was three years old, he arose early, as was his custom, washed and dressed himself, took his hat and cane, and went downstairs into the living room to see what was doing. No one was around but Snowbell, the white cat that belongs to Mrs. Little. Snowbell was another early riser, and this morning he was lying on the rug in the middle of the room, thinking about the days when he was just a kitten. Good morning, said Stuart. Hello, said Snowbell sharply. You're up early, aren't you? Stuart looked at his watch. Yes, he said. It's only five minutes past six, but I felt good, and I thought I'd come down and get a little exercise. I should think you'd get all the exercise you want up there in the bathroom, banging around, waking all the rest of us up, trying to get the water started so you can brush your teeth. Your teeth aren't really big enough to brush anyway. Want to see a good set? Look at mine. Snowbell opened his mouth and showed off his two rows of gleaming white teeth, sharp as needles. Hmm, very nice, said Stuart. But mine are all right, too, even though they're small. As for exercise, I take all I can get. I bet my stomach muscles are firmer than yours. I bet they're not, said the cat. Oh, I bet they are, said Stuart. They're like iron bands. I bet they're not, said the cat. Stuart glanced around the room to see what he could do to prove to Snowbell what good stomach muscles he had. He spied the drawn window shade on the east window with its shade cord and ring like a trapeze, and that gave him an idea. Climbing to the windowsill, he took off his hat, laid down his cane. You can't do this, he said to the cat, and he ran and jumped onto the ring the way acrobats do in a circus, meaning to pull himself up. But a surprising thing happened. Stuart had taken such a hard jump that it startled the shade. With a loud snap, the shade flew clear up to the top of the window, dragging Stuart along with it and rolling him up inside so he couldn't budge. Holy mackerel, said Snowbell, who was almost as surprised as Stuart Little was. I guess that will teach you to show off your muscles. Help, let me out, said Stuart, who was frightened and had bur and was bruised inside the rolled up shade. And who could hardly breathe, but his voice was so weak nobody heard. Snowbell just chuckled. He was not fond of Stuart, and it didn't bother him at all that Stuart was all wrapped up in the window shade, crying and hurt and unable to get out. Instead of running upstairs and telling Mr. and Mrs. Little about the accident, Snowbell did a very curious thing. He glanced around to see if anybody was looking. Then he leapt softly to the windowsill, picked up Stuart's hat and cane in his mouth, and carried them to the pantry and laid them down at the entrance to the mouse hole. When Mrs. Little came down later and found them there, she gave a scream which brought everybody running. It happened, she said. What's happened, said her husband. Stuart's down the mouse hole. Oh my goodness, boys and girls, that's the end of chapter four. First of all, that Snowbell is not a very nice cat, right? I understand. I mean, cats and mice usually don't get along, but Stuart's part of the family. Snowbell played a pretty mean trick. I'll tell you what, boys and girls, I'm going to go ahead and read chapter five because I need to know what happens. Chapter five is called Rescued. George was in favor of ripping up the pantry floor. He ran and got his hammer, his screwdriver, and an ice pick. I'll have this old floor up double quick, he said, inserting his screwdriver under the edge of the first board and giving a good vigorous pry. 
We will not rip this floor up till we have a good search, announced Mr. Little. That's final, George. You can put that hammer away where you got it. Oh, all right, said George. I see that nobody in this house cares anything about Stuart but me. Mrs. Little began to cry. My poor dear little son, she said. I know he'll get wedged somewhere. Just because you can't travel comfortably in a mouse hole doesn't mean that it isn't perfectly suitable for Stuart, said Mr. Little. Just don't get yourself all worked up. Maybe we ought to lower some food to him, suggested George. That's what the state police did when a man got stuck in a cave. George darted into the kitchen and came running back with a dish of applesauce. We can pour some of this in and it will run down to where he is. George spooned out a bit of the applesauce and started to poke it into the hole. Stop that, said Mr. Little. George, will you kindly let me handle this situation? Put that applesauce away immediately. Mr. Little glanced fiercely at George. I was just trying to help my brother, said George, shaking his head as he carried the applesauce back to the kitchen. Let's all call to Stuart, suggested Mrs. Little. It's quite possible that the mouse hole branches and twists about and that he has lost his way. Very well, said Mr. Little. I will count to three and we will all call. Then we will all keep perfectly quiet for three seconds, listening for the answer. He took out his watch. Mr. and Mrs. Little and George got down on their hands and knees and put their mouth as close as possible to the mouse hole. They called out, Stuart! and then they all kept perfectly still for three seconds. Stuart, from his cramped position inside the rolled up shade, heard them yelling in the pantry and called back, here I am. But he, was, he had such a weak voice and was so far inside the shade that the other members of the family did not hear his answer. Again, said Mr. Little, one, two, three, Stuart. It was no use, no answer was heard. Mrs. Little went up to her bedroom, laid down, and sobbed. Mr. Little went to the telephone and called up the Bureau of Missing Persons, but when the man asked for a description of Stuart and was told that he was only two inches high, he hung up in disgust. George, meantime, went down to the cellar and hunted around to see if he could find any other entrance to the mouse hole. He moved a great many trunks, suitcases, flower pots, baskets, boxes, broken chairs from one end of the cellar to the other in order to get at the section of wall which he thought was the likeliest, but he found no hole. He did, however, come across an old discarded rowing machine of, Mrs., uh, rowing machine of Mr. Little's and became interested in this, carried it upstairs with some difficulty, and spent the rest of the morning rowing away. That George, he loses interest in things so quickly. When lunchtime came, everybody had forgotten about breakfast. All three sat down to a lamb stew with which Mrs. Little had prepared, but it was a sad meal, each one trying not to stare at the small empty chair where Stuart always sat, right next to Mrs. Little's glass of water. No one could eat, so great was their sorrow. George ate a bit of dessert, but nothing else. When lunch was over, Mrs. Little broke out crying again, and she said she thought Stuart must be dead. Nonsense, nonsense, said Mr. Little. If he is dead, said George, we ought to pull down the shades all through the house. And he raced to the window and began pulling down the shades. George, shouted Mr. Little in an exasperated tone. If you don't stop ask, acting like this, I will have to punish you. We are having enough trouble today without having to cope with your foolishness. But George had already run into the living room and had begun to darken it to show his respect. He pulled a cord and out dropped Stuart onto the windowsill. Well, for the love of Pete, said George, look who's here, Mom. It's about time somebody pulled down that shade, said Stuart. That's all I can say. He was quite weak and hungry. Mrs. Little was so overjoyed to see him that she kept right on crying. Of course, everybody wanted to know how it happened. It was simply an accident that might happen to anybody, said Stuart. As for my hat and cane being found at the entrance to the mouse hole, well, you can draw your own conclusions. Oh, boy. Oh, and that is the end. That is the end of chapter five. So did he tattle on the cat? Not really, right? He just sort of said, well, you know, if you think about it, you'll figure it out. What an exciting couple of chapters, right? Stuart Little got up early, went down, talked to the cat, 
sort of got into a contest with the cat about who had better muscles and proved it by getting himself caught up in a, in a lampshade. At least he was not a lampshade, I'm sorry, a window shade. At least he really wasn't down in that dark mouse hole where he shouldn't be. Well, boys and girls, that was chapter four and chapter five. Check me out tomorrow and I will read you chapter six. Chapter six is called A Fair Breeze. So we're gonna find out what happens in chapter six. A breeze usually happens outside, so who knows? Maybe they're going to go outside. But either way, um, leave me a comment. Tell me what you thought of Chapter 4 and Chapter 5. And don't forget to click the Turned In button when you're done. And check back tomorrow for exciting Chapter 6. See you later, boys and girls.